Hello everyone, Harry here with a deeper dive on a couple of the important opinions in the Idaho abortion case that that came that leaked yesterday and came out today, the Moyle case it's called because Moyle is the speaker of the Idaho House of Representatives. Then that, that's who technically gets uh, sued here by the federal government. Okay, so remember, five members of the court agree. Let's just get rid of this case, pretend we had never granted cert in the first place. And um, the um, two, two um, Kagan and Sotomayor say, you know, this you, you were totally mistaken, as we said at the time, in entering the stay or even considering this case. It's a straightforward preemption where federal law is supreme. And to, to grant a stay means that you think that the state can, will prevail on the merits and what the hell. Uh, and then the three in the middle, um, as, or at least what people will say, are the th three emerging in the middle, Kavanaugh, Roberts, and Barrett. They don't take that position. They say the case has changed because in argument, it became clear that there's less of a conflict than we might have thought between federal government and um, state government. OK, that's where Justice Jackson comes in. We have interesting four people saying we should not dismiss this as improvidently granted. And the, one of them is Jackson. And Jackson is first says very strongly Look, I agree, and it's just manifest that this is a preemption case here. The federal law says you do this with someone who has an emergency that's not going to necessarily cause death, and the state law prevents it. Uh, guess who wins? You know, Constitution, Article 6, federal law supreme. You know, that's, that's just really clear. And I think she would say we probably shouldn't we certainly, certainly, certainly shouldn't have entered the stay, and maybe we shouldn't have taken the case, but guess what? Now we have. And as long as we have, and it's so clear, we should go ahead and decide the case. And indeed, she's got this good point um, about what it means uh, to that, that you dismiss a case as improvidently granted. And what that, what that means is, you um, realize that some that you didn't you didn't get the full picture when you um, decided to take the case. You were improvident. You were improvident when you granted it. That's it's not the vehicle uh, as Roberts and Barrett and Kavanaugh would use. You know, exploited it for here to say ah, it looks a little bit different to us now that we've heard arguments in our argument that happens like every day. And it's not what the writ is for. Uh, here, a, a quick uh, Supreme Court clerk, uh, story to illustrate uh, uh, dismissal for a writ is improvidently granted. When I was clerking, a, 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 there was a big case involving a legal issue and then just a really small factual issue. And a clerk wrote a very good long memo explaining why you should take that bigger issue and not the smaller uh, issue, so just take the big one, and then said, so I recommend Grant on question one, and the order went out, Grant on question one, <laughs> nobody realized until the briefs came in that question one that he said, Grant, it was the little one, or however he put it, or he said question two. So these perplexed um, litigants came in, you know, ignoring the big question with the little one, and then the court said, oops, it was improvidently granted. There was something we missed, and it was improvident. That's what a dig is really supposed to be. So Jackson's point is very strong, you know, and, and it's it's a little bit gutsy, too, because obviously the, it, it, it kind of puts pressure on Kavanaugh and, and Roberts and Barrett because it's saying we should decide this. And, you know, would they, in fact, if they did decide it in favor of Idaho, notwithstanding what seems clear preemption, so um, she's but she's really putting it to the court and said, this is not a case to dismiss as improvidently granted. And we've gone through the whole thing now and we've heard it. And it's, in fact, a bad case under the way we operate to dismiss it. We should now go ahead. There's no real argument here, by the way. I totally agree that it's, it's clear how the merit should come out. This is, you know, complete preemption. And Idaho law can't stand. But here we are. 
We've done it all. There's no reason to dismiss. So that's what she says. Um, now, um, Alito for Gorsuch and Thomas, in, even for them, among the most extreme uh, cases that they have, say also, we should go ahead and do it. Why? Because the stay was correct and Idaho is correct. So they're ready to say, first of all, there's no preemption here. Um, the the I mean, the argument, it, it's it's I, I don't know how they could actually write that case at the end of the day. They do want to want to rely a little bit on interpretations, you know, being closer. But still, that that just um, indicates in what's the area in which federal law conflicts with state law in that area. Federal law has to be supreme, but um, the, it, it looks as if um, Alito is saying it's not. First, he seems to see it only as a spending clause case. That is, the only thing that's going on here is the feds have said, if you take Medicare money, you have to do that. And he's saying it yields to that. And then second, a really kind of unnerving opinion is there's a mention in the federal regulation uh, about an uh, and, and federal law about unborn child, which seems pretty clearly to to explain certain situations where you would um, you would uh, under undertake a, a procedure to save the child uh, from uh, who you know could be could be born live or or so that's something that you're supposed to consider. And he somehow takes that and gins it up into a whole kind of, of uh, special solicitude under the law for the unborn child and a really sort of um, result-oriented grab to make it seem as if the, the federal regulation is itself so anti-abortion. So the combination of saying, um, yes, we should have kept this stay because the um, the state is likely to prevail. And then the actual um, uh, ignoring or completely mangling of preemption law is really a very kind of, of it, you know, far reaching. It's, you know, Dobbs to the next step for sure. If they, it indicates they would actually um say this Idaho law is fine, notwithstanding the requirements of federal law, that you can't just let somebody uh, uh, under, you know, have terrible um, medical consequences as long as it, they are short of, of death. Federal law doesn't countenance that. So remember, all that's happened here, you know, the, the headline could be, oh, the stay in Idaho is back in place. So as of today, Women who are in that terrible category of being, you know, and and the anecdotes in this case are as bad as anything you've heard with, you know, women experiencing permanent infertility and terrible medical problems because they couldn't get treatment because of of the Idaho situation, uh, and everyone have to be airlifted out, etc. So you know, the the uh, the case is still it hasn't gone away. It hasn't been decided in favor of federal law. All the court said was, ah, never mind. And now it's back in the Ninth Circuit. So after they decide and however they decide, the court could take it again. And we know that there are three votes for to basically uphold the Idaho statute in what seems like a complete running roughshod over federal preemption law. Uh, and so Jackson is saying, you know, let's do it as long as that if the let's let's have at it now. And um, five saying, no, no, not yet. But this may come back and it would be, um, you know, depending on what happens with two of the three of Barrett, Roberts and Kavanaugh would be um, far more radical yet than anything they've ever, um, any federal court has, has ever upheld uh, as against, um, you know, the, the rights of the reproductive rights of a woman. So ja Jackson saying no reason, not, no, no reason to delay. And, but the, and then three saying, you know, Idaho is going to win. And so we should just stay the course also. So for very different reasons, four votes for going ahead. That doesn't carry the day for now, 
but the day may be coming where they see this again on and and judge it on the merits. So it is not, I'm, um, I have to say, along with my friends and colleagues, Daya Lithwick and Steve Vladek, this is no triumph for abortion rights. It's the reinstatement of uh, the of, of a situation over what had been an insane um, period where um, federal law didn't operate. But all the things, you know, and all the legal questions and all it, all the sort of radical um, anti-abortion position that it, it possibly portends, it hasn't gone away. And uh, we still could see it, even in this case, as early as next year. So there you have just how um, radical the the three um, are, and then um, the the middle three now, at least where abortion is concerned, and and that's mainly because of how out there the other three are. You know, being the uncertain deciders of of the principle if it, if the case returns. Talk to you later. Thanks for tuning in. If you enjoyed this video and other Talking Feds content, please take a second to like and subscribe. Talk to you later.